Um, I'll introduce the next speaker, Brooke Peters. Uh, he's the director of, Reger of research at Complete Genomics. Uh, Dr. Peters uh, received his doctorate in pharmacology from John Hopkins University School of Medicine, where he also held the postdoctoral position in cancer genetics. After that, Dr. Peters was associate scientist at Genentech, one of the, the funding companies uh, in genetics, um, where he was a key member of the cancer genetic project, uh, the genome project. Dr. Peters uh, joined Complete Genomics in 2008 as a scientist and then um, moved quickly up to become the director of research in 2010. Uh, during this time, he has developed and patented several technologies, including a method for sequencing and haplotyping, haplotyping genome DNA called long fragment read technology. In his current role, uh, he leads a team of scientists in the development of high throughput sequencing with focus on uh, generating extreme high quality data from a few uh, cells, uh, including biopsies from blastocysts. Uh, to my knowledge, he's the first to have been uh, able to sequence a biopsy from an embryo, 98%, um, I think, uh, that we, uh, we were able to uh, obtain uh, a complete sequence of, of this embryo. And now he will present uh, his topic, uh, whole genome sequencing of embryos. Hi. Thank you for that nice introduction. Um, and so, as uh, Santiago just told you, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about a collaboration that, that uh, started as, as really as a result of Santiago approaching us and asking us if we'd be interested in trying to sequence uh, some small biopsies from IVF embryos. Make sure I get this right. Before I get into that, though, just a quick disclaimer. Um, so this project's very forward-looking. Uh, we, we don't offer this as a service, and I couldn't tell you when we might be able to offer it as a service. In its current form, the data is not perfect. Um, you know, it's a, it's a work in progress, uh, and, you know, we're constantly trying to improve and make it better. Uh, I'm a technology guy, not a medical doctor, so uh, keep that in mind throughout the talk. Um, and we didn't make any diagnostic recommendations on this data. So just, okay, so here's an overview of my talk. First, I'll just uh, introduce you to the company in one slide. Um, probably a lot of you have never heard of Complete Genomics. And then uh, I'll talk a, a little bit about um, some, some of the background that goes into genome sequencing. For a lot of you, this will be a review, and actually the, the previous two speakers touched on a lot of this stuff as well, so I won't spend too much time there. And then I'll get into uh, a, a few examples of some of the data that we were able to generate by sequencing these uh, small biopsies from IVF embryos. So briefly, uh, Complete Genomics, we were founded in 2005 by our chief scientific officer, Roddy Dermonitz our CEO, Cliff Reed, and then our former C CFO, John Kerson, and I apologize, I didn't have a good picture of John here. And actually, Roddy and Cliff here are, are sitting or standing in front of one of uh, the very early versions of our, of our sequencer. Um, we're headquartered in Mountain View, right next to Google. Uh, and we were really started with a very simple vision, I think, which is that people would send us their genetic material, DNA, and we would just send them back a full analysis of that, of that data or of that uh, material that they sent us. Um, and so it would be entirely outsourced. Uh, you know, the, we've, we've developed all of our own sequencing technology, all of our own processes for analyzing the data. This is a view of one of our sequencers. You can see it's very much not uh, designed for the, the consumption of, of a, you know, a consumer or, um, you know, it's not, it's not made to be put into an uh, academic lab. These are all kept on site. They're actually perfectly designed for what we wanted them to be, which is that it's very easy for us to swap out parts when they break, and they do. Um, or if, if better parts come along, it's very easy for us to upgrade these machines. We went public in 2010. 
And then we actually recently were acquired by a Chinese sequencing firm called BGI. Okay, so now I'll do a little bit of background here, I'm, and I'll apologize to all the geneticists in the room. Um, I wasn't entirely sure what the audience would be for this talk, so this is, this is very basic. I actually give this talk to the, uh, the engineers in our company because they have forgotten high school biology like a lot of people. Um, so anyways, you get 22 chromosomes uh, and then either an X or Y from each of your parents. And if you look closely, so if we, if we take a small region of, of each chromosome and we blow that up, you'll see that Roughly every thousand base pairs or so, there's a difference between the chromosome you got from mom and the chromosome you got from dad. And we commonly refer to these as heterozygous single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. And you've already heard that, that term thrown around quite a bit today. Um, there's a lot of other variations between the two chromosomes, but for the simplicity's sake, um, I'm just going to focus on SNPs today. So now, Commonly when your genome gets sequenced, what happens is that you start with millions of cells, you smash those all up, you take the DNA and you fragment it down to 500 base pair pieces, and essentially all of that information about which SNPs came from mom and which SNPs came from dad are lost. And, and the, you, know, you, you can identify the SNP, but, but the order of who it came from is completely scrambled. So complete genomics actually has a solution for this, which we call long fragment read technology. And it's actually a very, it's a, it's a fairly simple process, I think. Um, basically, you take a small number of cells, you, you break them apart, dilute, dilute that, and spread it across 384 different compartments. And essentially what that does is it separates out maternal from paternal parts of the genome. Um, now, there's a lot of other details that go into this, but, and, and I'm not going to get into those. That's a separate talk entirely on its own. If you're interested, we published it last year in Nature. But essentially, the end result is that after we do all of the sequencing and we assemble the genome, we're able to retain the, the information about maternal and paternal origin of these SNPs. And I'm going to refer to that in the talk quite a bit as phased. So. A little jargon for you there. Um, so one example of why this matters, and again, this, this was touched on a lot in the previous examples, and I'm just going to use a generic, really important gene X. Um, so in this, in this uh, example that I've, this fake example that I've created, we, we find that two of these SNPs actually code for um, code for an, a non-functional protein product from this gene. And so then the important question becomes, well, did you get both of those non-functional, uh, those SNPs that code for a non-functional gene, did you get both of them from mom or dad, or did you get one from each? And obviously, if you get one from each, then you have the potential to have a disease phenotype, whereas otherwise, if you have one good copy, you, you may not have any sort of a d disease issue. Okay, so let me get into keeping in mind uh, sort of that background that I just talked about. Let's, let's get into some of the actual data here. So as I mentioned, this collaboration was, um, was initiated by Santiago coming um, and asking us if we'd be interested in trying to sequence human embryos, and our response was, sure, let's try it. It's interesting. We'd never taken anything that small before and tried to create a complete human genome sequence from it. And so we started with small, small biopsies of four to 10 cells from unused, donated, five-day IVF blastocysts. And the first, first question really was, could we even do it? Um, and then, you know, if we can, is the data of sufficient quality that it would be useful? Can we identify genes that have been inactivated by heterozygous SNPs, as I'd kind of demonstrated in, in my previous part of this talk? Um, can we do things that are an absolute requirement for, for um, IVF analysis and are currently done by 
array CGH and things like that, such as, you know, can we find chromosome or partial chromosome gain or loss? Can we, can we find smaller deletions, which is, um, you know, even more difficult to detect? And then would we be able to make a recommendation about which embryo we should or shouldn't implant? And so this is a little uh, maybe poor artistic overview of the project. Um, but essentially, we, we had uh, seven different embryos where we were able to get biopsies and sometimes multiple biopsies from one embryo. And we passed those through two different processes. So one was the LFR library process that I'd mentioned previously. But we also passed them through our standard process, um, which does not give maternal and paternal information. Everything was ultimately analyzed through our standard complete genomics pipeline. And then we had to do a little bit of additional analysis for the LFR sequenced material. And so to answer the question, can we do it? Yes, we can, actually. Um, we, we were able to fully call anywhere from 87 to 97 percent of, of the genomes of these embryos. Um, 100% is really not possible. Uh, typically, if, if we have our, our best conditions starting from a million cells, we can call about 98%. So we're doing quite well. Um, the one thing that we noticed, though, is that when you start from this small number of cells, your error rate is very high. Um, and I, I don't want to go into all the explanations of why that is, but but what's important is that if you have phasing information, we found we could actually correct this higher error rate. And so again, I'm going to return to my really important gene example. And once again, we, we see we have a couple of heterozygous SNPs in this gene. And again, the, we find that two of those SNPs code for an ineffective protein product. And we look at the mom, and it looks like we got both of them from her. But then we, we look at dads and we see that we actually got one from dad as well. Now, we know that in this, in this particular instance, there's um, not any extra copies of the chromosome. And so this doesn't make sense to be able to get a heterozygous SNP from both of your parents. You, you know, you only get one, you can only get one thing from each parent. And so when we look a little further, we can see that we actually have evidence for, at, at the position where I have a T and an A, we have evidence of getting both of those bases from both parents, and that's, that's just not possible. And so, actually, we can do a little bit more analysis and, and identify that that T is, in fact, an error, and that the correct calls are as I have it here, and this gene would only be inactivated and in one copy from mom and not, not inactivated in dad as well. So now, that's sort of, again, an example, but how does this work in, in the real world? Um, so the, the tricky thing about assessing accuracy or your error rate in, in a human genome is that there's really no standard. There's a reference human genome, but um, that's, that's only so useful because everybody has a unique set of variations. And so the best way we've found for assessing accuracy is that we make two separate libraries from the same sample and sequence those and then compare those results. And so I've kind of depicted that here with two circles. And so, so typically you'll, you'll expect about two million heterozygous SNPs from an individual. And so we simply then look at the overlap between those two million heterozygous SNPs. Now regions that don't overlap, a lot of that will be errors. There, there will also be some, some parts where we covered that region in one library and we didn't cover it in another library. Um, so that's actually another version of an error rate. Um, and so here's an actual example of we had one embryo where we were able to make two separate libraries. And if you look at all heterozygous SNPs, you can see that about 91% of those are shared between the two libraries. But if you look at phased heterozygous SNPs, you can see that now that, that percent shared has gone up from 
to, it's gone up to 96 to 98% shared between the libraries. And so what we've done here is we're really enriching for what we think are true, and true, var true variants. So once you have an accurate genome, you can actually start creating lists of genes that look like they've been potentially disrupted. And so here, here's an actual list of 16 genes that we think are possibly inactivated in embryo number eight. And just looking at this list, I, I don't really see anything that, that looks like it would be an obvious uh, disease causing, um, loss of that would cause a disease. Um, and then also importantly um, is that in this box, these are, these are genes that appear to be inactivated and through a heterozygous me mechanism as I, was, as I gave an example of earlier. And just one more point to make about this is that, and I, and I think this is going to be a theme of whole genome sequencing in general, is that the technology to generate this kind of information is, is really becoming pretty mature, but our ability to understand what it means is still very far behind. So as I mentioned, we should be able to detect, if we're going to sequence the whole genome, we better be able to tell if you've gained or lost a chromosome. So this is a, this is a similar view to um, what was shown in some of the previous talks. Um, the way I've depicted this is slightly different. Um, I have here n normal copy number being two, and then because it add up mom and dad, so you get two instead of having it as one. But otherwise, it's a similar concept. So again, if you look at uh, a male, to, to give yourself a reference point here, so if you look at a male embryo in this case, you'll see one copy for X and one copy for Y. One additional thing that I've included in this graph that I, I think is really useful for these sorts of analyses is we just have added up the number of heterozygous SNPs in a, you know, within these 10 megabase bins that we're looking at here. And so this is actually another really useful way to measure whether you've gained or lost something because if you have zero heterozygous SNPs, that basically means you have one copy of that particular chromosome. And so as an example, here's embryo number 13, and we can see that we have about a copy number of one for chromosome two, and we have zero heterozygous SNPs. So I think we, we would be very comfortable in saying that this particular embryo lost chromosome 22. Embryo number eight, replicate two, is kind of interesting. You can see that there's a reduction in the copy number in red there, and then there's also a reduction in the number of SNPs. But, but it doesn't go to zero. And so I think what you're looking at there is uh, a little heterogeneity, uh, cellular heterogeneity. So probably maybe half of the cells in this particular library lost um, chromosome 13 and the other half didn't. And indeed, if you look just above it, so that's another replicate that was made from that same embryo. And you can see that there's no indication of a loss of chromosome 13. So can we detect even something smaller than chromosomes? Though? And, and so this gets a lot more difficult as you, as you try and get, detect smaller and smaller changes in a genome. Um, again, we're looking at copy number here, and this is copy number for the, for the entire genome um, for both mom and dad in aggregate. And it, it, if you look, it looks like there is a, a region there that dips close to one um, but there's some other regions in there that kind of dip close to one too. And th this is pretty common for w the kind of coverage that you'll see in a, in a human genome sequencing from a small number of cells. It's a little bit noisy. But the thing we can do is if we separate that signal into the maternal and paternal components, now we have a much clearer view. So you can see in red, one of the parents has copy number one almost entirely across that region. And the other parent, now you can see that they have this clear loss in that region where it went to zero. So answering the final question, could we make a decision about which embryos to implant? 
I'd say maybe. Um, you know, definitely we wouldn't implant embryo number 13. It had a clear loss of chromosome 22. Um, embryo 8 is interesting. We had two replicate libraries. One of them looked like it had a partial loss of chromosome 13. The other didn't, so you probably wouldn't want to implant that either. Um, the one thing I can tell you is that of all the embryos we did analyze, we never saw an inactivated gene where we would have concluded with any certainty that that would have caused birth defects or an unsuccessful pregnancy. And again, I, th I think to, to re-emphasize, um, we have to have better analysis tools. So, you know, we, we have the capability now to, to look this deeply into a genome, but we really don't know what all of those variations mean yet, and so we need bigger databases, millions of people probably, in both normal and disease states. So I hope I demonstrated that it's really important to, to analyze both the maternal and paternal parts of each genome. And, and also I, I hope that I demonstrated that accurate whole genome sequence from embryos is possible. The error rates are high, but we've, we've shown that if you use phasing, you can remove those, those, um, those errors. And our ability to fully understand all the, the changes in a human genome is way behind our ability to generate this high quality sequence data. So I have one, one last slide to leave you with, which is, and a, a couple of other speakers have kind of talked about this as well, but, but really I think uh, whole genome analysis will just be another tool um, for doctors to use to improve patient outcomes. And with that, a lot of people to thank. <laughs>